bonjour. Uh, I will switch to, to English. I'm very happy to virtually welcome you uh, today at the French Institute uh, to our conference COVID-19, uh, what impacts on our societies. Um, our guests uh, are, are here. I thank them, uh, I really thank them for their participation. Uh, here in Slovenia, but uh, in France too, and in many other countries. Hopefully, we are now recovering a little by little from the sanitary crisis. Uh, France has just uh, reopened its uh, borders uh, uh, without quarantine uh, to uh, most of European citizens uh, from uh, since uh, the 15th of June. Uh, but uh, as you, you know, uh, as you realized, uh, impacts uh, are huge and uh, I will give uh, the floor uh, to discuss it uh, and I, 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 I welcome also our, our moderator of uh, today's uh, conference, uh, Mr. Igor Bergant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Isabel. So um, hello to you all, especially to the audience. Uh, of course, we have a very interesting panel with very interesting questions and answers. But of course, we are inviting already everybody who is uh, with us to uh, ask questions via uh, the chat. We'll then uh, try to, um, to um, answer the questions after the initial uh, presentations of our guests. And uh, here they are. Uh, let's start with the ladies. Uh, Madame Cvitka dragos who is a doctor of, of medicine here in Ljubljana, a fantastic pediatrician. Uh, I can confirm Thank it. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Yeah. So we were always so happy to, to have you around and, and the um, results are fantastic. I might say thank you very much again. Uh, but of course, you, you're an um, excellent um, doctor of medicine and also former medical advisor to the French embassy in uh, Slovenia. You will um, start with, with telling us uh, about the health impacts of COVID-19 um, um, very soon. Then, um, of course, we have... Um, Professor Dr. Maja Zelaznik, who is a professor, uh, professor of international business at the um, Faculty of Economics of the University of Ljubljana, uh, and which is also a very important thing. You're the former Minister of Education, Science and Sport in the government of the Republic of uh, Slovenia. So thank you uh, for uh, joining us. Both ladies are based in Ljubljana. And then we have two gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Eric Breton, who is a professor of health promotion at the Graduate School of Public Health in Rennes, uh, in France. He will speak about the uh, health governance in response to the crisis. Everything okay in Rennes? Everything is fine. A bit uh, rainy, though. I hope you have better oh. than we do. So, so you have, have to come to Slovenia, then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should. I, I'm sure it, it's better over there. Yeah. In Slovenia, we have always beautiful weather. If it, it, it is not so good, then, then we uh, imagine that, that we have beautiful weather. Uh, and then uh, we have, of course, uh, also uh, Mr. Philippe Bertinchon, who is the deputy editor-in-chief of the French-speaking online the newspaper Le Courrier de, de Balkan, uh, which, which is based in Belgrade. So I, I can imagine that it's quite hot in Belgrade, not only because of the weather. No, it's also rainy. Oh, but if you accept the weather, yes, it's a bit hot. Yes. <laughs> yeah, th th this is a surprise. Rain in Belgrade. Uh, um, so uh, okay, uh, because we're doing it in English, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so we we, see, we start uh, we started with with weather. But let let let, let us go to the uh, to the main uh, topics of of today's conference. We will start with with Madame uh, Dragos Jancher. So tell us about the health impacts of COVID. 19, uh, you will probably base uh, your presentation on Slovenia, but of course later on we'd be very interested to, to hear uh, from you what you think also from, from other regions of, of Europe. But, but uh, let us start with you and uh, the health impacts of uh, COVID-19. Thank you, Igor. Uh, so of course I'm talking about Slovenia because I have a lot of experience, especially in the last two months. So SARS-2 COVID-19 uh, virus infection pandemic is really nothing uh, more and nothing less than another widespread uh, virus infection that humanity has been fighting for centuries. As a pediatrician that has been involved in medical practice in Slovenia, um, um, I would like to share uh, uh, my views about key challenges that this pandemic brought to physicians 
to uh, uh, people behavior and uh, uh, healthcare system. We have always been uh, threatened by viruses, bacteria, or fungi uh, that we will be coping with. According to some predictions, uh, in 30 years, we will be more affected by uh, various infectious diseases than chronic non-infectious diseases, such as uh, cardiovascular system diseases, even cancer. Uh, we have um, a specific uh, preventive programs to detect this kind of diseases uh, at an early stage in even more than 50% of cases. We have colonoscopy, skin cancer uh, uh, detection, uh, prostate cancer uh, detection, uh, mammography, etc. But it is impossible to have specific preventive tests uh, uh, to detect viruses which uh, didn't come yet before we get to know them. Drugi slide. Uh, however, we still have a very effective system to prevent unknown infections. This is personal preventive behavior, the fastest possible identification of infections, and of course, social distancing. That's why are we, we have meeting like this today. We all know that the best preventive for already known microbes is vaccination but only under certain condition. That means if most of majority of the population is vaccinated. Um, when they ask people in Slovenia if we it happened to, to have a vaccine against the COVID-19, 30% of people would be vaccinated. This is practically nothing. We won't be protected. Up to this point, we are more or less familiar with the measures or problems. Uh, second slide. Uh, new is the experience that practically no patient came to the outpatient clinic for two months. How can we explain this, knowing that otherwise we have usually 30 patients a day per one medical team? and even 60 in winter time or spring. Speaking about Slovenia, I don't know how much patients is per one medical team in France in other countries. Is something wrong with our health system or is something seriously wrong with us as users uh, that we cannot differentiate between what is urgent and important what is important but not urgent, and what is unimportant, or what we can do ourselves for ourselves. It remains to be seen whether in the upcoming normal circumstances, anything will change regarding the criteria of importancy. Most of the work on a primary level was done by way of telecommuni telecommunication, by telephone, by email or video conferences, which of course did not significantly reduce the workload of uh, health professionals, but it did reduce the possibility of infections. Does this mean advancement in the physician-patient relationship that will lead to more economic and safe working. Treaty Diaz, third, guys. Yeah, thank you. If so, how will the provision of healthcare services via so called telemedicine change the evaluation system of healthcare services? So far, a doctor has been able to send the invoice for its services to insurance company only if the patient had physically visited the doctor, or if telemedicine continues to gain ground, will this mean regression, leading to many much too late diagnosis and neglect of health? The next uh, challenge is money. I think it's next, yes. Yeah, thank you. 
how to ensure enough money for normal functioning of the healthcare system after the epidemic. Emergencies are extremely expensive for healthcare system. Slovenia was successful in its fight against uh, SARS-2 COVID-19, although it allocates only 8% of uh, its uh, GDP to health, compared to 18% in USA. What will be, prevent what will be preventive uh, examinations during pregnancy, childhood, and later on? Or what will be what the treatment of diseases after pandemics? Waiting time have been extended because of non-urgent cases were postponed. How and where to obtain funds for country to be able to continue fighting successfully a possible new epidemics and at the time of peace, ensure healthcare of the same quality as before and even improve it. Uh, next, yes, please. How to adapt our infrastructure for future epidemics and how to commit the society to doing so. Our recent experience has taught us how to curb the spread. Slovenia has been successful with its measures. However, to be able to work safely and keep jobs during a new wave or during a new unknown virus attack requires a long but quick step. The step must be made in architectural design of hospitals, retirement and nursing homes, public places, means of transport, local farming, and others. And above all, we must adopt responsible behavior and demand that these changes really happen. Our goal for the future epidemics is not to stop working and not to lose lives. Even if I worked with adult population the last years, I'm still a pediatrician. And my question is, how, as a pediatrician, let me conclude with a rather rhetorical question. How can we make sure that the children develop spontaneous immunity to the most common universal microbes if we live in the sterile world? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam uh, Dragos Jancar. Uh, before we go to Mr. Britton, I have perhaps one additional question, but of course, uh, all questions will be then answered um, afterwards. Well, because you, you, you told us um, how Slovenia coped with, um, with the uh, epidemic so far, and, and you, you also mentioned some of our, let's say, major uh, problems in, in healthcare, which is the uh, waiting time. Uh, but, but, of course, there are also discussions in Slovenia. Slovenia has a quite robust um, public health system. Uh, but, of course, we, we speak, we've been speaking in the last 10 or 15 years about, let's say, coexistence of, of the public health, health system and also the private sector in this, in this uh, uh, part. So, so uh, have you got any idea how, how this um, epidemic in Slovenia actually perhaps switched the the focus uh, in this question, do you think that, that uh, the common notion that, that the public health service um, is, is even more important now than it was uh, before, uh, before the um, epidemic? Uh, so epidemics and other widespread health problems uh, can be effectively coped uh, only by public health care because of uniform uh, management or uh, action. But anyway, we will need extra money. And for not urgent cases, a lot of fields of medicine could be leaved to the, uh, to the private sector. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so far, we'll come back to you with, with, with questions and in our discussions. Now we go to Mr. Breton, uh, as I said, professor of health promotion um, at the Graduate School for Public Health in, in Rennes. You will talk to us about the health governance in response to the crisis um, in France. So we're all ears here in Slovenia, how you actually see uh, the situation in France right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if you want me to have um, a, a presentation, are you giving me a control? Can I? Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Here we go. You see, you can see it, right? Okay, so thank you very much. It's, it's a real pleasure for me to be, uh, to be uh, here today, even if it's in my office. Uh, I, uh, I want to uh, basically first uh, uh, thank the Institut de, de Français de Slovenie for this uh, invitation. It's a great honor. And I'm very pleased to listen to the other uh, panelists. Uh, so, uh, just to give a, a bit of background of uh, myself, because my, my perspective is basically uh, is influenced by who I am and then who I am. I am a researcher and professor in public health. So, public health is about prevention, health pro uh, promotion, uh, protection. And so, I'm, I'm very much into uh, looking at those strategies that, um, that we, uh, we can actually implement to improve the the health of our population. So my, my take on uh, the health sector is really what you can do to address all those uh, problems uh, that prevent the, a good health in a population. And I'm especially uh, very interested, I would say, in uh, at the, what's going on at the local level. So what can do basically elected officials at, uh, in municipalities. So uh, I mean, so today what I want to uh, to present, uh, present uh, of course, it uh, will be brief. Is I want to show what basically our health system uh, um, present our health system, uh, show how it actually uh, cope with the, the crisis and the impact that we've uh, we uh, we experienced in this uh, crisis. So I'm going to draw some lessons out of uh, out of this uh, of this uh, event. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to say about our system is how complicated and complex it is. Here we have just tried to actually look at uh, the, the money trail, as they call it, of what, who, who's funding uh, what organization and at what level. So it's a very complex uh, health system. So we have a Minister of Health. Uh, we, we do, uh, and so the, the, the first thing I, I need to say about basically the governance in health, is that we, are, uh, we have a very centralized uh, health system. So everything, I mean, uh, uh, a big uh, uh, part of all the decisions are taken in the system are taken from basically from Paris. Uh, this system has, uh, is divided in 18 regions. So 18 regions that are basically the, where you have the headquarters of 18 regional health agencies. Uh, those, uh, among those 18 health, uh, regional health agencies, there are five that are actually overseas. So they are not in Europe. Uh, you can think of uh, Martinique, Guadeloupe, uh, French Guiana, and so that's uh, the other uh, health agencies. We also have a national public health agency uh, that is called Public Health France. That is basically um, sp is mandated to provide expertise and monitor uh, the health educators in, in France. Uh, they are, of course, uh, the, it's the, the center of expertise for uh, epidemics outbreaks, uh, of course. Uh, and we have at the, at the very at the bottom of this uh, of the system. We have cities, towns, and villages. So there are many of them. We have more than 34,000 uh, 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 villages and towns in France. I mean, they're basically regroup in different ent entities because uh, I mean, there's too many so, uh, uh, to manage libraries and, and all those um, services. Uh, what you need to know about those uh, cities, they are basically, uh, they don't have an official mandate for what regards self. This is not uh, the, 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 um, uh, this is not the area of, uh, of uh, they're mandated to, to work on. However, they are dealing with, uh, of course, uh, uh, public hygiene. So that means uh, sewage, uh, fresh water, uh, waste management. And they do, they do have, um, uh, and of course, local, uh, uh, local officials, or local, uh, I mean, mayors are basically uh, uh, interested in, of course, uh, improving the, the, the well-being of their populations. Uh, so uh, at the local le level, we also have, um, I mean, of course, pre primary care uh, providers. We have uh, many uh, uh, general practitioners. 
uh, they are not very well coordinated, so they're pretty much working on their own. We do now have a number of structures that group those uh, those um, those uh, general practitioners. And and the thing is that we have in France. I mean, like to go back to the mayors, we have uh, many areas. I mean, where uh, we 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 do have a shortage. Uh, I mean, a problem of access with uh, to a primary. Uh, to primary care, to the medical doctors. And so mayors are, very often you'll see mayors that are uh, deeply involved in trying to attract uh, healthcare providers in their, uh, in their region. So that's something that you see. So there's basically three main parameters we need to, um, that I'd like to, uh, to highlight so you can better understand how, uh, what happened during the, the worst of the epidemics. I mean, so those three parameters that uh, needs to be uh, mentioned. One is, the, again, the high degree of centralization of the, uh, the, the health system. There's also a long trend in, uh, in budget, uh, budget reduction uh, in the health budget, but in many, I mean, for many services of the state. Uh, so those budgets did impact the, uh, the healthcare services and the, the preventive services. And the other thing is there's uh, a clearly a lack of a, of a chronic lack of coordination of healthcare and, and, uh, and prevention professionals at the local level. So there's no, it's really, there's many initiatives, but it's not, it's not really uh, integrated into a, a real system. So that's the thing we need to, to, to know about here. So uh, during the lockdown, so the worst of the crisis, of course, we were all taken by surprise. I can say that I had a colleague from uh, two weeks before the, 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 the actual lockdown in France, so it's in, uh, back in March, I had a colleague from, uh, from Public Health France calling me, asking me uh, whether our courses were, were basically canceled because she was contributing to our teaching. And for me, it was outcomes. Why would that be uh, canceled? So it's really, even for public health organizations, we, we heard about China, we heard about Italy. We were still not really facing, uh, realizing how bad it was actually, uh, how, how bad the situation was. So this is to say that we, 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 we experienced a general lack of uh, preparedness to the, uh, to the epidemics. We, uh, we, we had a shortage of face masks, of tests. Uh, we had the government actually trying to see, to say, you know, those face masks are not, nece they're not necessary on the healthcare uh, providers at the hospitals need them. The test, I mean, it's good, but we don't need to, 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 um, to do that many tests. So what we saw during the lockdown were many initiatives uh, run by inhabitants, uh, NGOs at the local level, of course, and, and mayors. And those, um, those uh, initiatives were basically, uh, uh, what I can say, they, 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 um, you saw basically mayors and uh, so cities, uh, they, were, uh, they, they started distributing uh, face masks. I mean, the, the, mask, uh, the first mask we got in my family were uh, distributed by the city. Uh, they operated childcare centers for um, the staff of, uh, of uh, hospitals. I mean, people who actually needed to work uh, in healthcare services, they could bring their kids to the, the, those uh, childcare centers and, and uh, some schools. And, we, and they also organized uh, venues for uh, medical doctors to, to do a screening of people who suspe suspected they, they might have uh, developed uh, COVID. So the, they were all initiatives uh, that were carried out without much, uh, no much of uh, extra resources. They were just initiatives that uh, forced, because uh, people at the local level, they said that they needed to do something. So if I go quickly to the, uh, to the impact, uh, what we can say is that, uh, are the lessons, I mean, I'd say the, the lessons, the, the first thing was we really saw the importance of, uh, for the central government to set general rules and, and norms and allocating resources. I mean, that's a, a central responsibility. Uh, we, we've got uh, many, uh, the, the population was heavily targeted by uh, messages on the productive measures. 
Uh, I mean, I'm talking about uh, hand washing, physical distancing, and, and also including the need to, uh, to stop kisses and, and uh, handshakes. And kisses in France is a big thing, so that was really something to, to, to stop that habit. Uh, and we had those messages, uh, messages broadcasted on TV and radio. And, and it's interesting to see that even on, uh, to, to see on TV, for instance, TV show hosts and, uh, and guests were actually interacting uh, through uh, video conferencing. So there was really that norm that was set uh, that got people to, to actually comply very well to the, uh, to the rules. I mean, I have colleagues who are experts in this field of uh, how you get people to change behavior. And they were actually the first one that were really surprised how actually the, 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 the population uh, complied with the, uh, the protective uh, measures. Uh, but the thing is, we experienced 30,000 um, COVID-related uh, death, unfortunately. So this, it was definitely, we cannot brag about uh, any success. Uh, but the thing is, we, we also saw uh, that there's some, I mean, the lack of preparedness was especially true for hospitals. Uh, and that was really uh, the, the public, the population, they found out that healthcare professionals were truly not well paid, that, uh, that the salaries were not attractive and actually the healthcare services were really um, struggling to actually recruit, uh, recruit staff. And it's been going on for, for quite a while. Uh, we had GPs reporting a drop in consultations uh, uh, from, uh, of patients with chronic diseases. And so we suspect that part of the excess mortality that we, uh, we're actually starting to record in France, I mean, it takes a while before you get all the data, but part of this excess uh, mortality is actually uh, due to people who should have consulted uh, uh, a GP who but decided not to go because basically they didn't feel their, their problem was uh, important enough to actually uh, to consult. And, and so at the end, and, and the last thing we can say is that many institutions uh, um, found themselves waiting for the government to send their uh, instructions so they can do something. We've seen it in schools. I mean, schools were there, what do we do? And they initiated very little uh, things because they were just waiting for the government to, to say something. So, in terms of uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, of the ev the evolution of the system, as I can see it, but really it's it's difficult to say for the, the time being. But there's two two possibly two main scenarios, I would say. So the, the, the first one, which is really depressing, I must say, for a guy, for, uh, as a guy for, uh, from, uh, in public health, um, the first scenario would be to go back to this, uh, to this, uh, to this idea, this perspective of health as uh, healthcare delivered uh, at the hospital. So we, we did in the, the past few years, we had some uh, other steps toward developing capacity uh, to prevent disease and, and, uh, and outbreaks. And so it's, it's one thing that could happen that actually we go back to a very hospital-centered uh, focus on healthcare and system. And we see that in the uh, announcement. I mean, there's evidence of this in the announcements by the president of the country of the of a national health summit uh, that is strictly framed around the idea of, uh, of uh, around an agenda of uh, management of hospital care and uh, and the management of, it, of its uh, staff. So the second uh, main scenario, which is much more positive, would be basically a further decentralization of the healthcare, uh, health, not the healthcare, the health governance of the, the state. Uh, and in, in, in this, I see now a number of uh, NGOs and public health related um, professional associations that are actually uh, criticizing this idea of a summit uh, that is with an agenda just uh, centered on uh, hospital, uh, hospital care. So you see now, and, and, and this is um, uh, something that is also uh, pushed by a number of local uh, elected uh, officials who are also very, very vocal uh, of the management of the, of the crisis. 
and and basically you had all those mayors say they had too little resources to face the uh, the, the huge burden of uh, responsibilities they have to deal with. So uh, in, in this, it's interesting. I mean, uh, 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 one thing that was really um, interesting to hear last Sunday when the president of the republic uh, made uh, made a, a speech. I mean, to the nation, and he, he mentioned. Uh, the problem of uh, governance. He said, well, our country should give more leeway, uh, basically, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, the different organization. He said that we need to reform the, the action of the state to govern. So to give more leeway and responsibilities, you mentioned universities and regional and local health uh, agencies and mayors. So there's uh, obviously a diagnosis that has been done uh, made by the, 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 the top of the, uh, I mean, the, the, the prison and prime minister. To conclude, uh, I would say that basically uh, the, the, the epidemics as everywhere, I, I assume in the world, uh, has really, uh, has shed a very harsh light on the limitation of our government, uh, governance of health affairs. Uh, that is, in France, dominated by the central government. So we, we are, um, it really brought to the surface a number of chronic uh, problems that have been experienced for um, many, many years. So that, that's something that we, we, the, the government could no longer uh, conceal to the population. I mean, that was right in our face, I mean, really, all the problems. So we, we see that the, the, we do definitely need a capacity to mobilize and coordinate uh, resources. And when I say resources at the local level, and I mean expertise, organizations, networks, uh, money, equipment. This is something we need. Uh, and this is what we need basically to, in the face of exceptional events, such as a pandemic. But there are other events that are, are of course will happen. We just need to think of how we're going to cope with the, uh, the, the global warming that is going to really uh, bring a lot of, uh, of problems, difficulties, and we'll need to adapt to them. So basically what we need is, uh, is feet on the ground uh, with a real capacity for action. I'm done, so thank you for, for listening. You're not done, Mr. Breton. We'll still have questions, but uh, thank you very much for, for the time being. Uh, so that was the, uh, let's say, the um, healthcare part of, of our um, uh, Opening, uh, now we'll go to the um, economic um, and of course also education and the social impact of um, the crisis. Uh, Madam Zelaznik is, is the next speaker. W will you focus only on, on Slovenia or you will take, um, uh, let's say, a broader, uh, broader perspective? Because Slovenia is so small that we actually, we, we're, we're as big as, as one arrondissement in, in Paris. Uh, to be frank, so, uh, uh, so, so uh, will you look also um, beyond our borders? Yeah, I'll try to do so and thank you Igor for this kind invitation and especially for the invitation of the French Institute in Ljubljana. Um, I really appreciate that we talk about this, what is happening to all of us from different aspects and different angles and it's really my pleasure that I can share a bit of my opinions and views with such an experts around me especially from the health system or um, uh, viewers from different um, standpoints, which, which do matter uh, to talk about. And I think this is really what we need to do to somehow add to the uh, future development of what was happening to us and using it in a way that we can see also the positive, not only the negative side. And therefore, Igor, yes, I will focus a bit from the beginning on the global issues. Uh, global economic issues, and I hope that you can see on the screen um, the presentation. Can you all see it? Thank oh, you. Yes. And of course, thank you to the viewers and listeners of this. Um, um, truly is that um, the crisis as such, speaking economically, has never been um, as such type before. We could hardly say that something like that economically happened because even financial crisis 10 years ago um, had more modest effects really on the global input. And if we go through the IMF report and status right now, we will see that 
really, really the forecasts are not good. And they are not only not good for emerging or less developed markets, it's overall not a good forecast for what it is going out of the economic block, which was uh, given for at least three months now due to the virus. And um, it's not easy to say that only us in Slovenia, like a small country, as you have exposed before, were, is dependent in this global crisis. All of countries are actually codependent to what happened. And therefore, we all need to find a good way out with good measures and especially good support from the countries, from the governments. And governments have done a lot to help the economies. However, of course, we defer. We defer as, um, in, a, in, in a way how we see us as a size of the economy, but also we defer in the impact on the global chains and the, and, uh, the global economy sphere. And this is where, of course, it's um, for Slovenia very challenging that we were hit, it, uh, hit in, in manufacturing especially, but it is now the fact that we were all hit in services area and in service sector a lot. And this is just a recent um, um, graph published by, by one of um, economic institutions, uh, actually IMF, and it shows that not only the um, areas which were developed, but also the areas which were not developed enough were hit in the same way. And this is what we have to talk about globally, not only regionally and not only by each government itself, but openly for us, for example, for France, for Germany, for Slovenia, for Austria, it is the matter of what European, European Union will do and help and suggest to go out of this particular crisis. Um, this is the Slovenian stand right now, and if you can see this, the last data is from April, April purchasing power parity. This is how much we can afford as citizens in comparison to others, and it's declining all around the world. It's not just our case, it's a case which we are facing um, because of um, the block, the, the, actually the, the complete stop of certain industries which were not able to um, to be in production, which were not able to deliver, which were not able to be part of the global chains of global delivery, like for example, automobile industry. Um, if we compare this to Slovenia, Germany, France, for example, we were really, um, really damaged in that sense. So it is now the question what all this is bringing to us. First of all, one of the answers was digitalization and it was, it was mentioned before, uh, by um, the speakers, it is a solution. And what it has happened is that digital became a location, even, even a location for buying, location for ordering, location for doing business, location for doing more and more things than we used to do it before through or by digital. This is the fact which will stay. And also some business habits will change due to that fact. Or even, even we have changed even the school um, the way of um, the method of teaching because of using the new tools. But there is a major question here, how this global codependent supply chains uh, will handle in future, because I think that we need to redefine this and bring the supply closer. And this is what economies are now telling us, especially in Europe, we do have um, that fear and stand at the same time that we need to come closer. It's not just because of the China case and how lots of global chains have been cut for a while or uh, the delivery didn't work out or the production didn't work out, but it's also that being closer became an advantage. And I think that Europe here has an advantage to come closer. So to come uh, economically speaking, and of course, even in social terms speaking, closer in sense of our own potential and usage of all the capabilities we have here. Especially due to the vicinity and due to the delivery issues and due to the production issues, I think we do have a challenge now and I hope that we will handle it in, in a positive way. Also, what happened was that um, we were more and more going into ourselves, now speaking about the country economy and um, all the potentials we have, um, finding out more than we did before that uh, local potentials, that uh, local resources, local produ production, uh, local delivery is important. So local procurement should work. No matter that we are um, 
with less or more resources, depending on how resourceful, of course, and um, um, in potential the, the countries can um, be. And here we differ, of course. It is important that uh, local origin become important again. And I think we all have to use that now, especially now there is a huge debate about the local investments, about who can have the priority of being an investor and in what way, of course, still in competitive terms, but still how we will protect the capabilities, the knowledge, um, the, the, the developments we need to have. And there is one fear which happened and which is observed right now through the research uh, in last few months is that lots of development projects, lots of research, lots of uh, areas where we can go out of the box and do the new innovation has stopped. This is like Professor Dragos has mentioned before um, in the health system. So how can we contribute more and more to the people at the end of the day for better living, for better quality of life, for less diseases, for less viruses in the world? And this is where we have a bit of fear how to promote proactively go again into the development, into the investments, into the innovation, which can bring us better um, uh, and bring better uh, life for all of us. This is a challenge and this is why we have the potential also to see what locally can we do better, not only regionally and globally. Um, artificial intelligence and digital tools have hit us all. We are using them consciously, unconsciously. Um, it is a bigger impact to our daily lives, practically every second. Uh, we are connected in a way to some tools, to some digital world. Um, this is um, causing the change of behavior, communication, buying habits. Um, it is more and more of e-commerce, which is uh, being provided now due to the new circumstances. It was there before, but we just didn't maybe use it or we felt better than buying face-to-face uh, -face in a store, but now we were forced to do it differently, at least for a while. And this is what um, also the commerce the business has realized, so that there should be more channels offered to each of us when doing business or when promoting the products and promoting the services. But definitely um, e-digital type of life has um, tackled us more than we ever expected that it can happen in such a short time. So there were some changes in doing business globally, not only locally, not only regionally. Um, new ways of working. Before we didn't work so much from home or at home. Um, also, we had more traveling around for doing business, for doing, uh, of course, also tourism. Unfortunately, this stopped. And a lot of um, these habits, which or maybe new um, attitudes, which appeared uh, in the last few weeks, will stay. And lots of companies have already introduced them as something, um, as a solution which will stay uh, at least for a while or even permanently for the future. But as I mentioned before, um, what is important is that we do not stay just digitalized in transactional way, but that we are using this digital world and all the other world around us in the way that we do go forward into new innovation and new support for the development and new support uh, to prevent such happenings as we lived them through in the last weeks. So, um, of course, all systems were somehow um, tackled through the virus. And it has been said a lot about the health system and especially um, Philip said before a bit about it and uh, Professor Dragos and so. And we have been all very, very happy, at least in Slovenia, that the public health system worked very well. And we are still very happy that the public school system worked maybe not just from the start, but generally very well in sense of solving the situation and giving um, a new way or a new method, a new tool to go through the, um, th those few weeks of school. And um, I think that we have learned a big lecture here. And this is that, of course, we need to keep um, and we need to go uh, on with the new tools, with the new approaches, with the new educational uh, ways of thinking also but that we also need to keep the traditional approach, the face-to-face -face approach. I just had a recent experience with my students and they said, well, 
uh, we are really happy that we can go back to the class. We miss each other. We need each other. We like to talk to each other. We, we, we create and we solve lots of problems, lots of issues when we talk to each other. We, we help each other person to person. Um, and this is important also in the school system and lots of researchers around the world, um, even before and now globally and regionally, um, no extremes are okay, but we need to find a good balance. And since we are more and more in one side of the digital world, and on the other hand, so technology driven world, and on the other hand, we need still to keep the humanity and human way of um, socializing, then I think we need to create the right balance for today and for tomorrow. And we all know relationships matter. We are all human beings. We need this social context. We need to learn from each other. We need to create and to develop and to enhance the competences um, of each other. And I think that this part of uh, the society, uh, this is the, the, something what we've learned out of these few weeks and um, um, maybe even two long weeks of not having um, people around yourself which you would like to see and have uh, around you. Um, and just recent um, research by McKinsey, uh, where they studied the loneliness in, in this time, um, lots of people were really, really um, at the edge, but just feeling too alone, um, just feeling not being um, confident enough to cope with all this. And it's not just speaking uh, for the region of Europe, it's speaking, I'm speaking globally. And this is something what we need to face also, not only from the health standpoint, but also from the social standpoint, what we need to um, help to each other or support to each other when such circumstances happen. And um, the last, but definitely not the least, but very, very important, what we've learned as scientists, as researchers, is that science is more than ever needed to be supported, and especially a basic science. Um, we have neglected certain areas or maybe just pushed some of them more intensively, but now um, the whole world has faced the same, virus, the same virus as probably before, but how to cope with this? And I think that the science has many, many answers and we need to support the science together with the health systems, <coughs> and together with other public systems um, to, to support each citizen, each, each human being in the world in, in the right way and, of course, um, in equal terms. And this is where, of course, we come back to the global economic issues and global development issues. And really, really finally, what I um, somehow understood out of what it was happening here is that we turned around a bit a muscle pyramid, um, so from the top to the bottom around. If we have been really taking care of ourselves before in another way, then we are, um, or they, we were facing and we still are facing it now. Um, safety, health, these primary needs really were of a great importance. And also for that reason, values have changed, or at least have been not just outspoken in, in the declarative way, but really lived through. And I think that the major question which we have to impose ourselves, at least from time to time, is uh, what we state and what our lived priorities and values or living priorities and values truly are. So it's, it's all connected. Economy speaks about not only mathematics and e economic and econometric math models and uh, global impacts um, on our economic lives. It speaks also about social part, psychological part, and especially about the values and priorities. And I think that this is what in a way shaped us, all of us, each of us in its own way, but globally and through the big picture of impacts, I think we, that we have learned a lot and I hope that we will really take all these learnings with us for the better future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Zelaznik. Hopefully we would not forget because um, nowadays people are learning fast and forgetting fast. So uh, we shall see uh, what, what, what happened. Now, uh, last but not least, we, we move to Belgrade to Mr. Philippe uh, Bertinchon, uh, the um, 
um, from the French French uh, online uh, newspaper Le Courrier du Balkan. You will speak about um, the geopolitical impact of, of the um, pandemic. Well, uh, it's a fantastically interesting region you're, you're um, uh, reporting from because here, let's say, uh, a lot of political geopolitical powers actually clash. Uh, of course, the European Union, Russia, China, Turkey also, which is a very big regional uh, players. So, so uh, what were the geopolitical? What are the geopolitical impacts of of this uh, crisis uh, in your region and, of course, broader in 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 Europe um, and in the world? Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I, I will focus mostly on Serbia, which is the country where I live and where I work, and that I know the best. But I would say that what happened in Serbia is also true to what happened in different countries in the region of the Western Balkan. Uh, you know that in these countries, the, the democracies are still fragile. They've never been really consolidated. They are new. And I think that the crisis of the COVID-19 uh, weakens even more these uh, democracies. I would like to start to underline the paradox. Uh, considering the state of the health system, which was uh, weakened uh, by, uh, by a massive exodus of the medical personnel who left mostly to Germany, or there was also this interregional uh, exodus from, for example, North Macedonia to, to Croatia, and also the poor state of the hospital who have been neglected for years, we expected in uh, the beginning of March that uh, this Christ would be a human disaster. Uh, the fact is that compared to the Western countries, which are better equipped, like maybe France or Spain or Italy or Belgium or UK, uh, the number of, casual, of casualties is, uh, is, is comparatively low. And that was that was that was that was a, a surprise. But the the worrying uh, part of this was the uh, the role of the state, especially on the individual and public uh, liberties. And what happened in Serbia? Uh, it's a pattern that you can see in different countries in the in the region. First of all, nobody believed in uh, in the coronavirus. Uh, at the end of January, at the end, sorry, of February, beginning of March, there was a press conference where the president uh, Vucic was there with doctors, and they started to make joke. At the time, the coronavirus was the most funny virus on Facebook because it only exists on Facebook. Uh, one doctor recommended to the Serbian woman to go to Italy because it was the best time for the sales. So we were totally unprepared, and when uh, it started, everybody was taken by a surprise. So what did the state? On the 15th of March, the state of emergency was proclaimed, and three days after, on the 18th of March, it was the curfew. I have to say that in Serbia, it was the first time since the Second World War that a curfew was imposed in the country. Last time it was by the German, where the NATO bombed the country, there was no curfew. When the Prime Minister Gingic was killed in 2003, there was no curfew. So, and even during the epidemic of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 I forgot, in 1972, there was no curfew when the kids, the children, were playing in the park. So now, what did we see? We saw from one day to another army patrolling in the streets, equipped with firearms. Uh, the people, uh, the border were closed. The people, as the state of emergency, of course, was introduced. And the citizens were de facto under lockdown. Uh, and the elections were postponed. They were supposed to happen at the end of April. And they will now happen this Sunday, uh, the 21st of, uh, of June. So uh, I think that in terms of liberties, uh, the media the situation of the media was not great before, but it got worse and, uh, during that, that, that crisis. Uh, you have two types of medias. You have the medias which are controlled by the government, and you have a few remaining independent uh, medias. Uh, I think that what we call the, the tabloids, which is the government-controlled outlets, uh, they spread panic and fake news. People <coughs> don't exactly have good estimation of, 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 of what happened. Uh, in the country, while the uh, few remaining independent media, when they, make in, when they made investigations, uh, they had uh, immediately problems. 
Uh, there is two cases, one journalist in Vojvodina, the northern province of Serbia. She made a story in the hospital of Novi Sad, which is the second and third or third uh, biggest city in the country. Uh, to show that they were, the hospital was not equipped, that it was a chaos. There was no clear instruction to the medical care, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the nurse and to the doctors. And she was arrested. So she spent a few hours uh, in jail. Of course, there was a campaign and she was quickly uh, released. And the same story happened in North Kosovo, where uh, one of the rare uh, independent media, uh, Kosev, uh, its uh, editor-in-chief, she was uh, on the field to make a story, and she was also arrested by the police and spent few days in uh, in, in, in a few hours, sorry, in, in custody. Uh, these people, these journalists, were released, but the message was clear. The message sent by the government was clear. It is to the journalist: please don't do your job. Uh, people were also arrested. There was a singer. She came back from Montenegro just before the just before the state of emergency was proclaimed. Uh, she had no instruction. She didn't get any instruction from the police, and uh, she was uh, arrested because she was supposed to stay at home. What she didn't know, she went to her boyfriend, and she was arrested. And she was released after a campaign in the media, only after three weeks. So. The trends that we observed before the, 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 the coronavirus crisis, which were already present, get much more uh, 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 stronger. Uh, this is globally for the situation in, uh, in, in, in Serbia. In other countries, for example, in, uh, oh yes, I have, sorry, to add that uh, the, the, the state of emergency was not uh, really constitutional because it was proclaimed by the president, by the prime minister, and by the chief of the assembly, uh, without a broad consensus of the political parties, uh, it was it was it was imposed to the citizen. But there was no discussion, there was no debate in the parliament before 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 that. Uh, in the neighborhood country of Kosovo, what happened is quite exceptional because I think it's the one of the only country in the world where the government uh, felt down. There was a kind of legal putsch. Uh, there was a rivalry be between the former, at the time, current prime minister, uh, Mr. Albin Kurti, who was a long time in the opposition. He was democratically elected, and he was in favor not of a state of emergency, but uh, of a state of sanitary emergency, while the president, Tachi, which is his rival, wanted to impose the state of emergency, and they voted a, a motion of no confidence that uh, toppled down the government. <laughs> of course, that was a mere pretext. The, the real story was the support of the, you know, that there is a dialogue between Serbia and Kosovo on the recognition of independence of Kosovo. There is lots of talk about uh, exchange of territory between North Kosovo, which is majority Serbian, and South of Serbia, which is mostly populated by an Albanian population. And the United States seems now to really strong really support that, uh, that, 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 that plan, uh, which was not the case of Mr. Kurti, but Mr. Tachi wants to, uh, to, to, to implement that, that swamp of, of, of territories. So there was this putsch. Uh, in Montenegro, something also very weird happened, is that the name and the data of so the people who were infected by the coronavirus were public. The government mm, on its website uh, make it public. So the recommendation was to the population to avoid the, that people, you know, who they were, there was their name, and where they lived. Uh, I'm talking about the, the people who were uh, restrained to self-isolation. Uh, 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 in Albania, in Albania, many things happened also because uh, uh, in that case, it was a great personalization of the power, like in Serbia also. Uh, Mr. Rama, who is the, the, the prime minister, uh, sent the instruction by Twitter, or on Facebook, or in Instagram, uh, which means that the population who is not connected to internet did know when the curfew happened. They didn't know because it was uh, only, uh, this information were only shared by Mr. Rama to the people who uh, have internet. Uh, something quite scandalous happened also. There was the old theater of uh, Tirana that has been destroyed one night at four o'clock in the morning uh, while there was protest to preserve that uh, theater, of protest of the civil society, who got also the support of uh, European institution. But Mr. Hamad didn't listen to them and he 
profit of that uh, of that of that of that of that lockdown to send the 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 the, 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 the bulldozer to destroy that uh, theater one day at four o'clock in the morning, but also old uh, houses, preserved houses in uh, in Tirana were also uh, destroyed during that that. Time. The situation was a bit better in Macedonia, in northern Macedonia, where at least uh, there was still a uh, parliamentary debate about uh, the, 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 the lockdown, but these examples are rare. I'm not going to talk about the, all the countries, just to add that in Bosnia it was more or less okay. There was uh, very serious cases of corruption uh, concerning the, 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 the respiratory machines. Uh, Concerning the roles of the big power that you mentioned, uh, I would say that China, China came uh, on the, uh, in, increased its, uh, its, uh, its influence in Serbia. Uh, lots of material was sent from China. The president, thanks personally, his brother, the president of China, he came himself to the airport to bring the respiratory machine and to deliver it to the hospital. So it was very staged, very personal. Uh, while the solidarity, the European solidarity said it was a fairy tale for children. Actually, you have to know that the European Union uh, sent the most money to Serbia and in general to the country. We don't know how much China sent, but its support has been heavily uh, instrumentalized by, uh, by, the, by, the, by the authority. So we can see a personal power, we can see uh, uh, a weakening of the institutions like the parliament, the assembly, and uh, uh, a way to put silence the media and the civil society. Uh, I would say that unfortunately these trends, uh, to me it looks like a bit an experience. This happened this time, what will happen the next time? But we're still, and this is my, my additional question, we're still in, the, in this time because for example right now today in Slovenia there's a big discussion on, on the spread of epidemic again in, in, in the Western Balkans. So how do you see from, from uh, your perspective, why um, after the, let's say, initial um, um, quite successful um, uh, tackling of, of this epidemic, uh, why do we see now a setback in, in uh, this part of Europe? If you ask me the question, I will be very honest with you, and I think that you have to ask this question to the to the doctor. Uh, from 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 my point of view, what because I don't understand. Uh, now we have 94 cases, new cases in Serbia today, which is much more than uh, the number of cases when the curfew and the state of emergency were imposed. Uh, of course, I think the explanation is quite simple. We will have elections on Sunday, so it's impossible to come back and to, to reinstall the, 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 the state of emergency. Uh, I don't know, there is a new spread of the disease. Uh, Montenegro today uh, is not anymore uh, corona-free because uh, mm. there was only a few uh, cases, but no, there is a new rise. In Macedonia, in, my, in, Northern Macedonia, sorry, in Northern Macedonia, there is, I think, 196 new cases. Yeah. But uh, the state of emergency has been lifted. And again, you will have elections on the 5th of July. So the, the, the question is, were these measures necessary? The, the question that people are, are asking to themselves, were these very strict measures necessary or was it political? Because now that they see that there is almost uh, the same level of, uh, of, of infection, but everybody like, uh, lives like, uh, as usual. Nobody wears masks or, outside in the street. So it's, it's very warning. It's warning, it's, of course, it's, it's, it's very interesting and it could have also an impact to, to other parts of, of Europe and, and, and region. Now, uh, thank you very much to, to all uh, four of you. Now we, we start with the questions from our audience. We have received uh, one and it's actually directed to you, Mr. Uh, Breton. It is by, by Mr. Um, Araunik, who, who actually uh, sees uh, friends as, um, as um, let's say, a good example of, uh, effect, of an effective uh, cohabitation of, of public and private medical uh, practice. Uh, could you, could you tell us something about how the private um, uh, health sector has, has reacted during this, during this uh, pandemic? Because uh, the, the, the question comes obviously from, from a doctor. He, he was quite astonished that when they sent um, 
um, a patient uh, from Slovenia for surgery uh, to to France to private clinic. They were actually uh, they were asked for support to buy protective uh, masks for the French outlet. So, so uh, I know you, you you're a specialist for for the public sector, but what yeah. was what is your view um, of of the private sector? Yeah, I, li I like the question. I mean, because it uh, I don't want to see say that the. Uh, it's a total failure in France. It's not the case. I mean, we do uh, what what we have in France is this vision that uh, hospitals are the temple of the, the health policy of the uh, of our, of, uh, of this country. So that's that's a problem. I mean, everything is actually look at in the perspective of uh, of uh, hospitals. So at the um, so just to say, I'm starting with the hospital. Uh, the, the problem is they are underfunded and they've been for many years. There have been many people who were extremely vocal about the, the problems of uh, funding for, the, for the, the, the hospitals. And the other thing is that basically the, the, the nurses, uh, to name just one uh, of promotions, are very poorly paid in the system. So the positions that are difficult to fill in the hospital system uh, because the, the, the they are not attractive. So to go back to the um, to the uh, to general practice, uh, there's definitely been a drive in the next uh, few years uh, of integrating. I mean, to get those uh, general practitioners, uh, especially because there's a fair share of them that are actually liberal in liberal uh, medical practice, uh, to get I mean to get into networks to have this kind of uh, uh, of uh, integration. Uh, collaboration. So actually, there's no uh, one that is left behind because if you live, uh, the, the medical doctors actually choose where they, they will establish, which is the case in France. You do live, I mean, uh, a fair number of uh, areas without uh, GPs, and so they, they in this for the, the past few years, has been really that uh, that will to get practitioners to actually cover all the, the territory and to work together. And this is particularly uh, attractive to, uh, to young uh, medical practitioners. I mean, the young generation is no, not so, uh, so fond of working on their own in their little uh, cabinet. So that's, that, that's um, the, the thing. But to go back to public health, what we need is definitely uh, some, uh, a system that integrates uh, primary care, so I mean all those liberal medical uh, practitioners uh, and those who are actually uh, public uh, uh, medical practitioners, I mean to get together and to integrate uh, missions uh, regarding prevention. For instance, we now have uh, in France um, uh, uh, general practitioners prescribing physical activity. So that's one thing. So there's a real, I mean, issue with, I mean, uh, the level of physical activity uh, associated with chronic diseases. So now we've integrated, we've, we've succeeded somewhat to get medical pr practitioners to prescribe physical activity. I mean, there's a number of things. Well, so that's, that's a move toward this. Uh, we want more of this integration. And we want be, uh, I mean, all health professionals basically to work together because health is certainly not just about healthcare, but medical practitioners are very well positioned to see what's going on, to uh, to basically uh, to say what are the I mean to to be witness of the different the difficulties, especially health inequalities that we are we are observing. On the, so I'm not sure I'm answering. I know that uh, Mr. Ego has. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my bit. I'm I'm not into healthcare, so this is so that I'm I'm taking uh, I'm going a bit uh, away from my own field of uh, expertise. Okay, uh, thank you. I have a question for for Madame Dragos uh, Janser because well, you spoke about the Slovenia, obviously. What would we have seen during this uh, pandemic is is a sort of let's say localization of of everything. You know, the first measures were to actually close the borders. The video is quite small. That, that was probably one of the reasons that uh, actually it fared so well during, during the first phase uh, of, of the uh, epidemic uh, so far, because it is so, so small that, um, that it could isolate, isolate 
um, itself from, from other countries. But, but we're speaking of, of, let's say, the European project. We always speak that, um, that, that actually um, the communication and the cooperation within Europe is, is good for us all. How, how do you see this, this um, epidemic through, through uh, this notion? Is actually, um, has, has the European Union uh, done uh, done not so well during during this uh, during this uh, crisis. Do, do we do we actually uh, see not not a sort of deglobalization um, in economic terms, but but also when it comes to healthcare uh, and and uh, perhaps other other um, health measures that actually um, the EU has has uh, has proven itself sort of as, as too big and too ineffective for for the questions you also raised during your presentation? So I don't think that uh, uh, my or our work uh, was under any influence from uh, abroad, from uh, a European Union or something, uh, some other organization. We have our own protocols and we worked um, um, as we used to work and uh, something else there was a big big crisis at the beginning 15 16 of march nobody think about uh, uh, no, uh, what uh, thought that uh, we have to think about something else we just go to the office and we simply work we didn't uh, expect to have some special in instructions mm -hmm. we have instructions we had instructions from a uh, um, institute of epidemiology but not how to work, uh, how to cope with the problem. We knew that, as we know always. Mm -hmm. And but even uh, I wouldn't uh, share um, the same experience uh, where the decentralization in Slovenia is quite small. And uh, we, of course, there are small differences between uh, different regions, but not so big. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, because we have uh, uh, some... Uh, um, uh, unions, uh, pediatricians, general practitioners, and we share opinions, we share information, we share everything, and uh, we simply cannot uh, react on the other way because you are out of the system. So I think that medicine in Slovenia is good, and uh, if we, we will keep that way, I'm not afraid of... Uh, Yes, hopefully we will, we will uh, remain um, in, in the way we actually go. But we, we, of course, have, have uh, also big, big problems when it, when it comes to, uh, to the future because, let's say, of our demographic um, uh, structure, which is, uh, which is not something unique in Europe. It's actually, it's actually more outspoken in, in, in Slovenia because we, we have a very old population and it will get it will uh, get uh, older uh, because you, you, you actually asked yourself uh, so many rhetorical questions during your presentation. Do you, how do you see, let's say, um, uh, the, the possibility of, of, a, of a broader European answer to, to uh, all of this? Or, or do you think that it actually remains, uh, although the, the uh, problems are quite, quite common in Europe, that, that the answers actually lie lie with the, uh, with the uh, national uh, healthcare systems and national states? I think the, that the uh, health uh, care system in Slovenia is maybe even better than in other countries. Mm -hmm. So I have experienced because I, I have over the last uh, uh, 20, maybe 25 or 30 years, I work a lot of uh, people from abroad and uh, uh, I see how they are treated here and uh, I, I also have uh, their um, informations and uh, I could I, I, I can compare with the other systems and uh, I think that this is uh, the privilege of a small country um, so I don't know what to say else okay so uh will probably remain small in, in the decades to come, so it's actually good for us. So, um, uh, You know, more important than the uh, issue of private or, uh, or public health center is uh, uh, quality control and supervision of the both system. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that in Slovenia, we have this control. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we have we have another question from our audience from uh, Mr. Sedley Klein. Uh, it it, uh, it actually touches the the question of the role of the World Health Organization during this uh, pandemic. Madam uh, Drago Shanshuk, uh, how how do you, as an expert in, in medicine, see see the role of of, of W H O in in this time? What? I didn't understand you got well. Uh, how, how do you see the role of the World Health Organization during oh, the pandemic? Oh, oh. I didn't notice any influence from World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think in Slovenia, it's not so important than in uh, Africa, in uh, Asia, uh, Asia and uh, other countries. I don't, I don't know. I, but I don't work uh, on this level, you know, mm. I'm just a worker in the factory. Okay, uh, Mr. Breton, any, any thoughts from you when it comes to uh, the World Health Organization? Well, I mean, the, it sets norms, it sets, uh, I mean, uh, it's not rules because the, the, the WHO has no, no power to, to say it's a, it's a very weak organization. However, it's, a, it's an organization that actually uh, can uh, give set uh, I mean, uh, guidelines of practice, uh, set orientations and get people. I mean, there's basically the, the, uh, the, uh, those conferences that allows, uh, I mean, different uh, states to, to, to share their, 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 their knowledge. So it's a very important organization. I mean, uh, I, it's not maybe not really seen as important by uh, a number of countries, one in particular, but it, it does. Uh, I mean, we're always using uh, the, 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 all those guidelines that are produced by WHO, and we are involved in producing those uh, guidelines I and mean, researches. And, and those guidelines are very often used to actually make a point to uh, to reform our, our system and to say this is uh, what the, the international consensus and uh, so it's uh, i mean it helps uh, quite a bit mm -hmm. um, professor zelaznik uh, what, your view you're not a uh, medicine expert but but of course uh, who is, is is a far more important organization it deals also with with, with uh, international cooperation how, how uh, do you see its, its role during this this crisis um, thank you, Igor. Um, I will put my view from the other angles because I'm definitely not an expert in the health systems or understanding the whole not yet. processes. But, but um, I think that they have done quite a, an interesting role. From the beginning, they were not maybe tackling the issue severely enough. But when they found out that it's truly, truly globally and that it is pandemic being uh, in first of the cases really in depth globally, then they have uh, worked really a lot, especially maybe we didn't really feel that so much, but Africa, Asia also, they were um, tackling that areas very, very um, seriously. I'm involved in one of the center of human rights and sport, and I know that activities from, from that perspective. And I have to say that they have really somehow put together all the capacity, knowledge capacity and system capacity to try to help and at least to review um, what circumstances and what um, also um, after uh, impact can such a pandemia have. And um, what I think was also seen, not maybe um, from the first side, but definitely in a few weeks that even the top top management and the top leaders have understood how important their role is not only um, in the health system, but also politically and economically, because all such decisions can hit all the systems, not only one part, but the global world generally. And I think this is what we have all learned out of it, um, how dependent we really are, speaking globally, uh, human to human actually. And I, I hope that we really, learn something out of it. Yeah, hopefully, yes. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Um, uh, Bertanchon, uh, because you, you touched this, this um, aspect also on, on the uh, impact of, of, the Europe, of the European idea of the European Union, uh, particularly in Serbia and in the region 
as a whole. How do you see the, the let's say, the consequences of the EU position uh, in, in this region um, after the, or during the, the epidemic? Uh, regarding, regarding everything what's happening in, in the region politically, uh, uh, do you think that it will have a, let's say, bad impact on, on, uh, on uh, the role of the European Union um, as, as seen, for example, by, by, by the citizens of, of the countries of the Western Balkans? It's a good question because uh, <coughs> uh, I came in the Balkan more than 10 years ago in Serbia and uh, I think that 60% of the people at the time were in favor of the European integration. Uh, today it's the opposite. 60% of the people don't care anymore about the European uh, integration. While as I, as I said, it's the, 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 the European Union is the most important uh, donator in, uh, in Serbia and uh, in the region. Um, I would say that they, it's a bit late now. It's a bit late because, uh, the, the, you know, about the, the European integration, Serbia had opened lots of chapters, but this chapter are still open since 10 years. It's going very, very slow. So the people, and they see also some changes in Europe in terms of, of, of democracy, and they don't, they, Europe is not anymore really uh, attractive as an ideal as it was uh, before. On the other hand, people in, as individuals, they move to Europe to work because not only for financing, financing reason, mm -hmm. but also because the, the system, the structure is much better in, in, in Europe than, than here, and there is more hope. Uh, here, the political situation is a bit blocked, so people, they don't see uh, their future in the region, so they, 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 they prefer to leave. But you have also to know that I think that Europe is partly responsible of that situation because it didn't show up enough what they, do, what they did. And, uh, but there was also some manipulation from, uh, from the government in that case with China. The, Ch the role of China was uh, much more exaggerated than it was really, that, that, that what Ch China really did while European Union went a bit, uh, the role of European was uh, minim minim minimized. Minimal. Minimal. Do you think, uh, okay, you said too late, but do you think that, that actually European Union uh, should have done more uh, also during the, the um, let's say, the start of the epidemic to, to show support, to, to help uh, these countries? Uh, could, could, could it also somehow help to, to avoid these uh, political, um, let's say, uh, directions the, the, uh, the countries of, of the region actually uh, moved uh, into could, could could we in European Union prevent the, the let's say even more dictatorial approach by by the local I wouldn't say warlords but 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 let's say presidents and then leaders. If you, if you ask my personal opinion, I'm, I'm not sure. You know that uh, Serbia and Montenegro, a couple of months, have been degraded from the state of uh, uh, democracy in transition to hybrid regime. Uh, hybrid regime means that in theory on the paper the democracy and the democratic institution are there but uh, in, uh, in practice uh, they have been kidnapped by a fistful of, uh, of, uh, of leaders who, 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 who worked, uh, with the, worked in, the, in, in, in their profit, personal profit. Uh, so it's 20 years, more than 20 years, that the European Union tried to put these countries on the path to democracy, and obviously it failed. So I'm, I'm not sure that uh, that European Union can unfortunately be really uh, effective. They give some recommendations. Everybody say yes, yes, but uh, in fact, you don't see any effective change. So the virus, on the contrary, on the contrary, yeah. yeah the, the virus wasn't helpful in in, in this way. So the, because we have no no questions. Uh, from from our chat, then I will do the the last roll call, um, and I'll start with with the gentleman, uh, Mr. Bertenshaw. Uh, for example, if we if we have the same discussion in one year, uh, what do you think the the situation in the region uh, would be? Probably no elections uh, in that time, because they will be they will be done. Yes, but but, but how do you think that 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 uh, the, the whole situation could evolve in in your 
Well, yeah. concerning the elections, we might have much more elections because it's like a fashion to have elections every six months in the in the region. Uh, no, I don't know. What I think what's important is to point out what will be the uh, economical uh, consequences mm -hmm. of, of that crisis in the region. I know it's too early because we know that it's not going to be good, but we cannot... Uh, we cannot uh, we cannot define exactly what will be uh, the the kind of collapsing of the of the economy uh, in terms of we will see just this summer with the season uh, in touristic country like Croatia Greece uh, Montenegro what will be the consequences but here you know everything was stopped uh, people have, were forced to go back to the factory without uh, with a minimum of uh, of protection. Uh, so I think it's a bit early to anticipate and to to know how the the the, the situation we will will be in in one year if we have that conversation again. But I think that uh, the concrete effect on the economical situation will be will be obvious by then. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Breton. Well, we, you 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 actually. Uh, uh, in the end of your presentation, you, you uh, spoke about two directions. Uh, when it comes to, let's say, decentralization, uh, how quick could it be in France? Because we know that this um, centralism, the, the French uh, centralism is actually based on, on centuries of, of uh, since the French Revolution, actually. Uh, so so, so how, how quickly could this transition be in, in the way you, you actually proposed? Well, I'm not so enthusiastic about, I mean, I, I think there'll be changes uh, just for the reason that, I mean, uh, the, 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 the coronavirus was an event and will, will still will be for the next few months, if not years. But there are other things coming, uh, coming up. I mean, the global warming will have those uh, heat waves in France and all over Europe. In the, in the, in the, and those will actually have put a lot of pressure on uh, our health system, but also all the, the, the services, the government services. So, I mean, the last uh, few years, I mean, the, the, the kind of uh, perspective on governance, very, very neoliberal, that uh, very small state with, I mean, fewer services. I think it's, it's coming to an, uh, I mean, I think we're getting close to the end of this uh, perspective. And we see, I mean, now in France, it's not just uh, the COVID. People are on, out uh, on, on the streets for uh, the problem with, uh, I mean, the, the, the violence uh, from the, uh, the, the, the police corps. I mean, there'll be all kinds of, of major problems. The health inequalities and social inequalities are a big issue. And so I think that I mean, I, I don't think it will go very quickly. We could be very surprised. I mean, uh, you, you don't take my word because, I mean, we may be very surprised. But there's other uh, factors are probably going to push for reforms in the system. That other factors have nothing to do with health, actually. That's not be my, my Okay, let's do the Slovenian way because in Slovenia, ladies have the last word. Uh, Anyway, uh, so um, Madam Zelaznik, uh, in one year, uh, how, 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 how could the world uh, uh, be if we face, let's say, another wave of, of uh, uh, pandemic or even, even worse, like it was with, with the French flu? Uh, is, is this a very, very let's say, grim, uh, uh, grim um, way of, of seeing can can we can we see even uh, an even worse situation in one year yeah i hope not but um the forecast right now and especially this new wave um being exposed literally in this week is showing that we really have to take into consideration that uh, some um stop downs of of certain industries can still happen and that's not good. That's definitely not good. Purchasing power is falling down in many countries. Plus, um, gross domestic product forecasts are really, as I presented before, um, rather negative. Um, however, what I think will happen um, in each of the country is that um, some measures will go on because they will need to go on, like the first packages of support to the companies. Um, as we uh, proposed them in Slovenia and as other countries did 
um, they will need to have certain continuation, at least for certain industries, because we depend on them. Um, example of Slovenia shows we are highly dependent, export dependent country because being small and because being economically so well connected with Europe and global world. Uh, there are more such countries and um, despite of the size of the country, we will need support for um, certain segments to still develop and that we do not uh, raise the employability to the extent that we could not manage it. Um, I really, really hope that we can step together in a sense to find all the resources which can support a good development. And that doesn't mean only manufacturing, it also means in services, and especially it means to support to the systems, like health systems, like school systems, because these public, especially public systems, need to be firm, need to be strong if we, would, if we want to continue um, at least the quality of life we had, or at least something similar. Um, so each of us will need to contribute to this, um, I would say, it's in a way, social agreement, not only for each country, but generally globally. And um, therefore, I don't really see very bright, bright near future, but I hope that we can um, step together for the long-term future to be solid. Okay. And someone mentioned, um, just maybe to, um, a very good, good um, mentioning was about the, the global warming, warming right? Um, we faced, all of us, how suddenly we can change the world, really, without traffic, without any pollution. We did change it in four, five weeks. Wow. Okay, so we can. We can, if we want. And I think this should be also economic message. Oh yes, uh, the price was quite high, but but it was worth seeing it. Yes, uh, last but not least, uh, Madam Dragos Jancher, we need a very positive uh, note for uh, for our farewell. You're a pediatrician, so you can actually uh, you can actually uh, give us some some positive uh, uh, positive message for for the end. Well, well it was very interesting the, the the question you actually posed yourself uh, in 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 the end of your presentation uh, regarding the children um, um, in, in a sterile uh, world. Well, it was a rhetorical question, of course, but uh, what, what is your answer to, to your question? So I think that the children will find somehow the way to get dirty. So I don't, I'm not afraid of uh, uh, to to be too sterile world for them. But one thing maybe I would like to mention anyway, uh, we have to realize I work still in a public and a private health center. So I'm fond of a public health center too. But I think that we have to realize that private investment in healthcare significantly reduces um, expenditure in a uh, funds uh, of uh, public funds. Mm -hmm. So we have to more uh, with more sympathy look at private sector too. Okay, so it's a part of a solution, not, not a problem. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to, to you all, to the panelists, of course, to the to the audience, and thank you very much to the organizers for for uh, giving us the possibility to, to um, talk in that way for the last hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> I, I bet it's still raining in, in, in Belgrade and Rennes, but here in Ljubljana we have beautiful weather, so we may profit from the rest of the daylight still. So um, from my side, it's... Um, it's Evilly and running. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, a short, but a short run anyway. Thanks to you all. Thank you yeah. very much. Okay. Thank, thank you so much you. for the invitation. Okay. It was interesting. And thank, thank you to Igor for a great um, um, moderation of all of us. Um, it was really nice. Thank you. Thank you, neighbor. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 bye.